Before we get down to the nitty gritty, I want to thank my animators Adam Mitsuk or Kuzim and Tyler Addison for the animations in this video. If you like their work, consider following them on Twitter. Links in the description and comment section below. Now, on with the show. 252 million years ago, the world was a changing, broiling mess of hot rock, floating plates, and climatic shifts that transformed it into something of a hellscape. Over a short period of a hundred thousand years or so, Earth changed from a steaming lost world of strange oddities to a lava-ridden globe in which over 95% of all life, plants included, went extinct. This chunk of time is known as the Great Dying. Lifeforms did what lifeforms do and rebounded from this incredible apocalypse. New forms took shape many millions of years later during the geologic period known as the Triassic. These new critters, now capable of taking on all niches imaginable, diversified into shapes never before seen with many bizarre experimentations of evolution. One of these strange organisms is the long-necked B-movie star Shringosaurus indicus, the Indian horned reptile, the real-life version of the beast from 20,000 fathoms. Happy Triassic Week! Hope you've all been enjoying the content so far. Let's get into the nitty-gritty. That nasty mass extinction marked the end of the Permian period and start of the Triassic. It flushed out the synapsid rulers of the food chains and ushered in the new archosaurs. These guys were faster than your average reptile, as many had high metabolisms on par with modern mammals. They were also smart, capable of thinking on their feet and adapting to any situation thrown at them. In tens of millions of years, some would branch off to become the dinosaurs, others the pterosaurs, and yet many more would diversify into all sorts of alien forms. Some of these critters survived, like the crocodilians, and others went extinct, like the alicotosaurs. The alicotosauria is a huge clade of early archosaurs. They didn't last long, only from the mid to late Triassic, but were wildly successful in colonizing most of the world's supercontinent. They may have been displaced by dinosaurian herbivores, as many took on shapes rather similar to everyone's favorite long-necked browsers or barrel-chested horned himbos. Some, like the Trilophosaurids, were like modern iguanas, rather large, lizard look-alikes with short, robust skulls stocked with short, leaf-like teeth adapted to cutting through all manner of vegetation. Another potential group of Alicotosaurians were the Craniosaurids. Like today's flying lizards, their ribs were long and supported thin membranes for gliding. The third group of Alicotosaurians is the Azendosaurids. They took the robust herbivore thing that the Trilophosaurids were doing to the next level. Their bodies were elevated so that they had huge forelimbs and sprawling hindlimbs. Their necks extended and their snouts came to a point. They were the Triassic Archosauromorph equivalent to the sauropod dinosaurs, and the biggest among them happened to be the most bizarre. 2017 saw the description of a bone bed full of bodies of an Azendosaurid from India. Saradi Sangupta, Martin Escurra, and Saswati Randiopadye described the remains as Shringosaurus indicus, out of Sanskrit's shringa, meaning horned, Latin's soros, meaning reptile, and indicus for India as its place of origin. Altogether, the find included at least eight individuals. The holotype was made out of a partial skull roof, and the paratypes were the rest of the bodies found in the bone bed. The bone bed itself was excavated out of the Denois Formation, a layer of rock that dates to around 247 to 242 million years ago, the Middle Triassic. Thanks to the bone bed's preservation of individuals from all walks of the genus's life, a good picture of the creature's life can be pieced together. Shringosaurus's most unusual feature is the pair of semi-conical horns jutting out of its skull. They're placed above the eyes and are fused to the eye socket bones. These horns are pointed forwards and bent slightly downwards like those of the Ceratopsian dinosaurs Triceratops and Pentaceratops. 
either, though to me their overall shape is more similar to those horns of the abelosaurid Carnotaurus. The skeletal diagram in the original paper used the skeleton of the closely related Azendosaurus and then just added in some bones from Shringosaurus. This resulted in a critter that's actually less bizarre than it actually was. As you can see, the first interpretation of the skeleton that came with the paper shows Shringosaurus with a moderate length neck that sticks out horizontally from a robust cylindrical body with narrow spines which create a hump over the shoulders. This version has huge shoulder blades, short but thick forelimbs, long sprawling hind limbs, and a boring lizardy tail. Paleoartist Ashley Patch noted that the fossil dimensions given in the paper don't match their proportions in the skeletal diagram. This means that if the bones were scaled up to the size they actually are, the skeleton should look wildly different. She came up with this skeletal diagram. Now, I'm not willing to jump on any old trend devised by any old paleoartist. However, she did her homework, and I think this is accurate to the true dimensions of the fossils provided by the paper, which described Shringosaurus in its entirety. The real Shringosaurus was even more sauropod-esque than initially thought. Its neck vertebrae were huge, creating an elevated, thickened neck attached to a body held at a 45-degree angle. The front limbs were semi-sprawled and longer than the back limbs. The femur was almost horizontal from the body and held in a total sprawling posture. All four feet were plantigrade when they touched the ground, with the heel completely kissing the soil as it walked. The issue here is that the data provided in the initial paper were correct, but the diagrams were not. This means a whole new paper isn't exactly required to set the record straight, just some proper PSAs. The Shringosaurus skull was triangular, and the end of the snout was pinched. This means they were pickier about what they ate. To contrast, a critter that tends to eat a bunch of different things tends to also have a wide snoot to gather those things all in one go. Shringosaurus' teeth were pen or peg-shaped, like those of early sauropods, what used to be called prosauropods when I was younger. The horns of Shringosaurus may have been sexually dimorphic, in other words, they were specific to one sex or the other. Which sex that was is entirely unknown, but not every single skeleton in the bone bed had skulls with horns. Smaller, probably younger individuals lacked the devil horns. The research team who described the bones suggested that Shringosaurus horns began to grow and increase in size once they reached sexual maturity as a sign of sexual fitness. There's even speculation of their use in territorial bouts between males, but there's no way to know exactly who was sporting the horns. Texture preserved on the horns suggests a keratin or keratin-like covering adhered to the horns in life. This makes the horns only horn cores, with their true length potentially being much longer. Shringosaurus was a large member of the Azendosauridae, with the largest individuals capable of reaching up to 4 meters 13 feet in length. This is technically based on the largest ones found in the bone bed, so they could have gotten bigger. They needed to be this big and tall in order to reach the glossopterid trees, huge ferns, or ginkgos that dotted the landscape. They weren't quite large enough to feed upon the scaly lycophyte trees, but may have snacked on stuff cycads dropped. It's entirely possible they co-opted their chisel-shaped teeth for crunching up insects or small vertebrates when they needed some extra protein to grow big and strong. The fossils of Shringosaurus were found in rock deposits which belonged to the Denois Formation. This layer of rock also preserves the remains of organisms that made up some of the ecosystem the horned beasts from 20,000 fathoms belong to. The rock is separated into two layers. The lowest is composed of thick, sheet-like, medium to fine grain sandstone with some red mudstones. The upper layer is mostly mudstones with some layers of ribbon-shaped channel-filled bodies and sheets of sandstones. The fineness of the sediment that makes up this rock tells us that the area was mostly a lowland floodplain. Rocks are continuously broken down as they calve off the highest elevation locations. As they make their way downhill and towards points of low elevation, they're weathered and eroded until they are but microscopic grains of minerals, or sands. 
so the finest sediment, muds and silts, are what you find in the lowest places where water carries them, a lowland floodplain. You can then narrow that further by what kind of fossil critters or large veins of minerals you find in those rocks. The lower section of the Denwa is most probably a lowland floodplain, whereas the upper section of the Denwa that has mudstones and some sandstones switched to a more fluvial system, or a slightly higher elevation freshwater river environment. Always remember, environments are constantly changing, and so are the huge deposits of sediment that make up the ground upon which you walk. Shringosaurus comes from the upper section of this layer of rock, meaning it enjoyed the foliage that surrounded the rivers and streams. It's impossible to know if they preferred more upland environments or the ones they were buried in. In the rivers where the Shringosaurus group died lived many organisms, like the lungfish, Ceratodus. These guys were similar to today's lungfish, but some could get pretty massive, and they survived from the time of Shringosaurus to the Eocene Epoch. Huge crocodile-like amphibians, known as Capitosaurians, were present here in the form of Paracyclotosaurus and Cherninia. There are fossil remains of an undescribed Brachyopid amphibian as well. These guys looked a lot like our modern salamanders with huge, rounded heads and paddle-like tails, but were very unrelated. The amphibians also included a long-snooted form belonging to the Traumatosaurid group. Outside of the rivers were Rhynchosaurs, a bizarre group of archosauromorph reptiles with rodent-like incisors that formed a beak with which they cracked open hard foods or stripped veggies off the surrounding flora. Small to large-sized Dicynodonts were also contemporaries of Stringosaurus and likely competed with them in size. Dicynodonts were mammaline synapsids with short tails, squat limbs, a pig or hippo-like complexion, and massive chompers lined with sharp beaks and carrying only a single pair of teeth in the form of multi-use tusks. No dinosaurs have been found in this layer of rock, but surely they were here too, in the shadows, waiting for their chance. The unceasing march of the sands of time have revealed yet another critter to add to our intellectual menagerie of antediluvian beasts. What did you think of Shringosaurus? Let me know in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. Make sure you leave a like and comment on this video, share it around and subscribe. While you're at it, ring the notification bell too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Want to help Edge out? Subscribe to the Patreon at any tier you like for a whole smorgasbord of delicious offerings. Many thanks to Thea Svensson, Steve Bradshaw, Staniforth Hopkins, Natty Cat, Dinosaur, Arda Bayer, Abby Smith, Henry Brennan, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron. You've all helped to make this channel possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you.